You might have seen numerous daggers, but prepare to be captivated by one that transcends time itself. It's Korean, purchased way back in 1951 by Guest's stepfather, who served in both the Navy and the Army. The craftsmanship is remarkable. It's made of slate, fashioned after ancient Chinese bronze designs from around 500 to 700 BC. And it's in such incredible condition, still sharp after all these years. As of its history, this dagger likely belonged to the Yayoi people, an ancient ethnic group from Korea who migrated to Japan. It's not just a tool, it's a piece of ceremonial artistry, meticulously crafted for important rituals. It could even be from the Gojoisen period, dating back to 1000 BC to about 500 BC. That's like holding a piece of history right in your hands. As for its value, well, brace yourself. Because similar pieces have sold for around $20,000 to $30,000 at auction. Oh, my God. Nah, come on. Seriously. And this can easily be insured for a whopping $50,000. I'm thinking of the stepfather who was not a favorite of mine and now has become one. Jewelry has always been a passion, especially when it comes to jade. Today, we have a stunning jade necklace with interconnected carved balls and gold wirework links, which dates back to the 1930s or 40s. The guest family invested around $5,000 in this timeless treasure. Next up are a pair of elegant earrings featuring diamonds and jadeite cabochons, likely from the 1960s. These caught their eye for about $3,000. Lastly, there's the remarkable jade and diamond ring boasting a cabochon jade surrounded by diamonds set in yellow gold, which is another $3,000 investment. Despite slight variations, the necklace exhibits excellent matching jade pieces, with the ring likely remounted from older jade material. You can see that the cabochon is uneven, right. and this is very typical of what we call old mine material. Now, for the exciting part, appraisal values. The necklace originally bought for $5,000 could fetch around $7,000 today. The earrings, valued at $3,000, could command eight dollars to $9,000 at auction. But the real winner is the ring, with its exceptional jade quality. Its value has soared to an impressive fifteen dollars to $20,000. Thank you, Peter. That is such good news. And this looks like a little jelly belly. But it is a jelly belly, isn't it? <laughs> but it's not worth the jelly belly. <laughs> no, a little bit more. The owner acquired a pair of candelabra from his former silver buyer from Macy's in New York who worked there in the late 50s to early 60s. Perfect accessory to compliment your loveliest <laughs> dinner table. I love that. Believing them to be created by George Jensen due to a catalog from that era. The surprise comes when the pieces, beautifully designed with a pomegranate motif, reveal a different hallmark upon closer inspection. Although not authenticated as Jensen's, the candelabra shows meticulous craftsmanship, hand hammering, and an American silversmith's work inspired by Jensen's style. An auction estimate, I think you're probably looking at maybe $6,000 to $8,000 as an auction estimate. Well, that's still a nice price. Yes. The guest shares the intriguing story of discovering a Confederate belt buckle in his father's cotton field while hunting. The belt features 11 stars and CS, symbolizing the 11 Confederate states. The appraiser unveils its historical significance. This is one of the most desirable style of Confederate buckles ever made. It's made by a firm named Leach and Rigdon. The belt is made from cast brass using a sand mold. This is a cast brass buckle. They would take a sand mold and actually mold the buckle out of molten brass. Despite the owner's alteration for wear, it remains highly desirable. How much would this be valued? I would ask between ten to twelve thousand dollars. Wow. Not well, bad. Not bad for finding something in the cotton field. <laughs> Yes, family heirlooms include a Bible, letter, and button, acquired from her grandmother's trunk in 1895. The letter and Bible belonged to Gaston Baldwin, who died in the Civil War. Well, he was killed at Goodall's Tavern, and his cousin retrieved the Bible and mailed it back to his sister with the letter, and that's about all I know of. The bloodstained testament and the bullet damage on the Bible depict the heartbreaking story. The other item is a button with a sunburst design and is extremely rare. The appraiser estimates the combined value of these items to be around $10,000. Well, I sure do appreciate it. <laughs> I, I am amazed at uh, 
at the value of it. An Olympic torch brought by the guest unveils the interesting story. Getting the lifetime opportunity to catch the torch for the 1988 South Korea Olympic Games. The appraiser praises the torch's design, with crossing dragons symbolizing unity between East and West. The guest has no plans to sell it, intended to be a family heirloom. And it's such an iconic item. But I can't, I can't accept money for it. I'm an amateur. Yeah. <laughs> Believed to have belonged to the guest's great-great-grandmother from Hawaii, this Chinese Celadon vase holds a rich familial history. Its age is attributing it to the 18th century, a pinnacle period in Chinese decorative arts. Examining the vase's intricacies, it has carved porcelain body adorned with geometric patterns, a ruri band, and finely detailed Buddhistic lions chasing ribbons. Despite signs of wear, a worn foot rim, and discoloration, the appraiser commends its authenticity, labeling it an honest vase. With its classic bottle form and bulbous base, the vase exemplifies 18th century craftsmanship. Most importantly, it is valued at $25,000 in today's market. Wonderful. You've made me very happy. <laughs> Tests hold historical treasures, safeguarding secrets and stories. But this one is truly remarkable and gives a glimpse into a bygone era. It has remarkable features, including its Queen Anne figured walnut craftsmanship and Philadelphia origin likely dating between 1745 and 1760. It has exceptional detailing like the canted corners, fluted pilasters, and triple-faceted foot, which are indicative of a few select cabinet makers from that era. The chest's unique size, described as diminutive, adds to its value, making it more desirable to collectors. Despite some condition issues, such as a refined surface and minor repairs, the still value of the chest significantly, estimated at $12,000 to $18,000 at auction. And with its original surface intact, its value could soar even higher to thirty to fifty thousand dollars. Oh, really? On this chest, I would never have known that. This beautiful portrait of the horse has great significance within the British art tradition, particularly in the realm of animal portraiture. While the piece is not signed, it bears resemblance to the works of renowned artists like George Stubbs, suggesting a likely creation date of around 1830. Despite the frame not being original, the portrait still holds considerable value as a fine example of English animal portrayer. While its quality and historical context, its auction value is estimated to be between $12,000 and $18,000. Good heavens. Unbelievable. She's come up a winner again. Yes, she has indeed. Bless her heart. Amidst the vibrant art scene of Houston, a captivating acquisition emerged for the guest. A color lithograph by none other than Rufino Tamayoy, a luminary in the realm of Mexican art. Bought about 10 years ago, this piece has a surprising secret. Tucked inside its frame is the top of a beer can. The appraiser examined the color lithograph, noting its significance within the artist's body of work, which includes over 100 prints produced during his later career. The piece, typical of Tamayoy's style, boasts striking wall presence akin to those renowned murals. Signed and numbered, it was acquired for $2,500 and is in excellent condition. Most importantly, the value of Tamio's work has surged in recent years. At the auction, its estimated worth ranges from four dollars to $6,000, with a retail price potentially doubling that amount. This man unexpectedly found a remarkable piece of furniture in 1982. Bought for $40 at a rummage sale, this piece became part of the owner's family. A once ordinary chair revealed to be crafted by the renowned Scandinavian designer Arne Vader. Vader created numerous design works that significantly contributed to shaping the appearance of Danish design. However, there was an intriguing thing about the furniture that the appraiser had never seen before in a Danish design. These, these uh, straps, which are about 16-ounce cow leather, I'll add, mm -hmm. um, are nailed on, and they're done so in a, in a semi-kind of not precise way. He gives a speculation on whether they were original or possibly replaced in the past. Uh, they, they don't tend to have that smooth, symmetrical look that Danish design is so, so known for and, and cherished for. If the straps were indeed part of the original craftsmanship, the furniture commands an impressive fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. Even if they were replacements, the estimated worth would still be a substantial six to nine thousand dollars. A story unfolded around a cherished family heirloom, a century-old boat with a rich history. The guest fondly revealed that the boat came from his grandparents' home and his mother gave it to him. The toy turns out to be a masterpiece crafted by one of the best American toy makers, George Brown, in 1880. The side wheel configuration is probably one of the most popular designs. 
These pieces have a crossover appeal because people who collect toys like them, but also people who collect folk art. It marveled at the intricate painted tin design and remarked on its enduring charm. It's really charming work with all this filigree, the pierced tin work and the stenciling. A lot of this paint did not survive. Despite a missing piece, the owner preserved the boat in its original condition. How much would its value be? I would say this boat at auction today would easily bring three to five thousand dollars. <laughs> Elizabeth. <laughs> A cherished lithograph was brought in by the guest. It was originally belonged to her grandfather, a passionate train enthusiast. Upon her grandfather's passing, it passed down through her family to her. The lithograph revealed to be a theme of railroad temperance. It reflects the broader temperance movement that eventually led to prohibition in America. The movement called for people and governments of various levels to outright prohibit alcohol. There's a good reason for that. The old-fashioned saloon, people were being poisoned, families were being wrecked. I mean, alcoholism is a, is a problem, always has been. This print was created in 1863 during the American Civil War in Boston. The lithograph vividly illustrates the consequences of alcohol, aiming to raise awareness. It's a print filled with all sorts of meaning and history. Plus, you've got the original frame. The estimated retail value of this unique piece ranges between $2,000 to $2,500. <laughs> what do you think of that? <laughs> I think that's fantastic. The story unfolds with a fisherman figurine passed down through the guest family. Acquired by her great-grandfather from a former fishing fleet captain, Alpena, Michigan, the wooden figure with eerie red eyes found a home in the basement near the coal bin. The piece turns out to be a late 19th century trade sign. It is a sign that is beckoning a profession, a fisherman, where one would go in and buy fishing supplies for the profession. This trade sign was crafted from white pine, a favorite wood for its carving case. The sign bore the name T. Kroniger from a Detroit, Michigan address, representing the artisan Theodore Kroniger. The details of the piece, such as the word fisherman, are also etched onto it. And you said that this was stored near the coal bin. Correct. I suspect it was subjected possibly to heat. Oh. And that's how you created the surface over here. The piece reflects a time when such signs were a visual language for those who couldn't read or speak English. So this figure would have been outside a shop, possibly up high over the door of the shop, so that people, when walking down the street in either direction, could see what is going on inside that shop. Given its historical significance, the estimated value of this piece was three to five thousand dollars. I'm amazed. <laughs> This guest stumbled upon a captivating piece at a garage sale in an alley. Eager to rescue it from potential disposal, she carefully brought it home. Today, because I was hiding it from my husband, because he gets upset when I bring home things. <laughs> Intrigued, she had attempted to research the artist, but only uncovered a few information. The only thing that I, I found about the artist is that he was American, right. and in the 1800s, he would draw murals of the Grand Canyon. It's revealed to be a chromolithograph by the renowned American painter Thomas Morin. His wife, Mary Nimmo Morin, was also an artist. Both were exceptional artists producing paintings and prints. This chromolithograph was commissioned by the Santa Fe Railway to promote Western tourism. The frame appears to be the original frame. Many of them were made. It's not a particularly rare print, but it's a very good print. The appraiser noted a few condition issues as he examined the piece. Got a little bit of pigment loss right here. You've had a, an insect inside here. Despite the imperfections, the value ranges from twelve to fifteen hundred dollars. A great price for a used to be garage sale item. Wonderful. For an alley find, that's great, yes. <laughs> a pearl and diamond necklace is being showcased. The guest inherited the heirloom from her grandmother, acquired at ten thousand dollars in nineteen eighty eight. I've worn it for my wedding, and other than that, it lives in the safe deposit box. The piece boasts platinum craftsmanship, adorned with diamonds and small natural pearls. The centerpiece is a five-carat diamond, while the top one is two carats. The piece holds high significance due to its rarity and originality. It's authentic and in its original condition and in its original box. How much will the item be valued? This piece should bring $250,000. <laughs> in wow. the marketplace. <laughs> the guest brings a unique piece owned by the famous grandmother. The double ukulele case was owned by Mei Singhee Breen. Take the ukulele lady. Breen put the ukulele on the map. 
The ukuleles were made by Martin Ukuleles. The first was a custom-made 5K ukulele inscribed with her title, and her name was also on the headstock. The second is a more regular 3M ukulele. They were dated to be around the 1920s to 1930s. The case, the ukuleles, and the history, they carry a value at about... In a vintage shop, we're probably looking at a, at a retail value of about $15,000. Okay, great. A fascinating piece of American history is brought to the show. The 1846 folding map of Western America was found by the guest in his late uncle's library. The map, which was issued in 1846 by S. Augustus Mitchell, is located in Philadelphia. The map shows some interesting geographical features of Western America at that time. One such feature is Oregon and how large it was. This was the year that the Oregon Treaty was signed between the United States and Great Britain to determine the boundary between American holdings and British holdings. This shows how important and timely these maps were, as they showed what was happening. This map represents an important year in U.S. history, as within two years of its production, the U.S. expanded its territory. Because at this time, this whole area, that was still part of Mexico, yep. and the Mexican War started in 1846. Two years later, that became part of the United States. Texas also paints a fascinating image. Texas, of course, claimed that. This was just after Texas became a state uh, in 1845. The rare map, which is still in very good condition, is valued to be about... In a retail shop, this generally is, sells for about $12,500. Oh, wow. A ring befitting of its fancy title. This lovely tiara ring was bought at a garage sale in McGill, Nevada, by the guest and fiancé at this time for the sum of $1,250. The ring was made by Marcus & Company, which is located in New York. The ring is made notably of 18 karat gold, green enamel, and a few carats of diamond. The appraiser valued it at about $6,000. As of 2014, it was valued at about $12,000. Well, good. Not bad for what I paid for it. <laughs> the lithograph was given to the guest by her elder sister. The lithograph is by the artist Grant Wood. Wood was a Midwestern artist known for his famous painting, American Gothic. He was a regionalist artist, and alongside painters, Thomas Hart Benton and John Stuart Curry advocated regionalism through his works. This lithograph was one of the 20 different lithographs made by Wood. It is titled Fertility and was made in 1939. It's in the original mat. You can see on the edge of the mat, there's some brown on the mat cut. That probably translates to some mat stain just beneath the mat, which is not going to be very detrimental to the, the value of the print. It is considered one of Wood's popular works due to the similarities in scenery with his iconic American Gothic. 250 pieces of the lithograph were published by the Association of American Artists in the 60s. The lithograph is valued at about... Would be in the neighborhood of $10,000 to $12,000. Oh my. So. <laughs> I'm very surprised. <laughs> A collector of unusual mid-century modern pieces brings this unique piece to the show. The George Nelson prototype floor lamp was brought from an antique dealer by the guest and her husband in Sagatuck. Having been familiar with the Nelson bubble, they had never seen it in the form. George Nelson, who was the lead designer for the Herman Miller Furniture Company in the 1950s, produced numerous exciting 20th century modernist furniture, of which this is one. I looked at this with a couple of my colleagues, and we do believe that it's a George Nelson prototype. I've never seen it in the marketplace, and I do believe it's George Nelson. This piece is great. The prototype lamp holder was valued at about four to $6,000. In 2022, the value rose to between six dollars to $9,000. Wow. Interesting, because I paid $280. This particular piece exemplifies Robert Cumston's ability to meld traditional and contemporary elements within his sculptural practice. The sculpture stands tall at an impressive height, commanding attention and admiration from all who encounter it. Cumston's masterful manipulation of materials such as bronze further adds to the sculpture's tactile allure. The guest describes the sculpture as Picasso-esque. And if I look at her face, I really it, she really does look kind of Picasso-y yeah. to me. You said the way her eyes sit up on top of her head makes it Picasso-esque. In examining the sculpture, one cannot help but be captivated by the intricate details and textures that adorn its surface. Each etching and carving tells a story, inviting viewers to delve deeper into the artist's narrative. The sculpture seems to radiate with energy and emotion. Its form exhibits a harmonious balance between organic and geometric shapes, creating a visually dynamic composition. This vintage bathtub was a game changer in its time. Crafted by renowned plumbing fixtures company J.L. Mott Iron Works, this bathtub showcased intricate design and advanced functionality. J.L. Mott Sits was truly ahead of its time, showcasing innovation and luxury. 
This great piece dates back to 1990. Its design indicates it was made in the Victorian era. We have porcelain over cast iron. We have an oak frame. I believe the feet are made out of brass or bronze. This rare sits bathtub goes for about $3,000 to $5,000. This beautiful piece of furniture takes us back to the year 1830, where expert craftsmen poured their heart and soul into creating masterpieces like these. The guests purchased it from a family that lived in Albion, Indiana. Made from solid oak, the Pennsylvania Dutch dower chest features a distinctive hex sign design on its front panel, symbolizing good luck and protection. Poplar is a common wood used to make these chests. Poplar is a wood that uh, has a nice smooth grain and it accepts paint very readily. In the Pennsylvania Dutch culture, these chests were often given to young brides as part of their dowry. The intricate hand-carved motifs, including tulips and hearts, further enhance its visual appeal. However, the value is in the paint. It's not just a piece of furniture, it's a tangible link to the past and it's valued between. We'd estimate it probably twelve to fifteen hundred dollars. A fascinating book which reflects a portion of Portland's colorful history. The crime album contains the details and pictures of persons who, between April 1902 November 1903, were in the Portland prison. The mugshot book was given to the guests by a family friend who worked in the Portland Police Department. The books were converted to microfiche and thrown away. This oddly fascinating book provides detailed information on each criminal, from the name, alias, crime, body features, and much more. Interestingly, another feature of this book that catches the eye are the mugshots. Crime. These images have a relationship to photography that's part of a new genre of yeah. photography called vernacular. This form of photography refers to amateur or everyday snapshots taken by ordinary people capturing daily life moments. The picture are very collectible as fine art photographs by institutions or private collectors. Because when we look at these pictures, they tell us something about people that speaks a universal truth. At auction, the album is valued at six to $9,000. That's wow. I will all be surprised over that, yes. A book like no other, the book whose value is not in its title or the author, but in the touching message inscribed in it. The book, which was bought by the guest's wife at a local library auction for 15 cents, is shown to be used sometime in 1942 as fourth grade textbooks at the Santa Anita Japanese internment camp. It was owned by a Japanese-American woman named Nakako. She taught the fourth grade during her stay there before her transfer to another camp in Arkansas. The book contains farewell writing from friends, colleagues, and students wishing her well and hoping to see her again. And this is a really touching letter where the woman says, although we may not go to the same camp, we'll see each other again, and I'm hoping that we'll arrive at the same camp so that we can continue on with our friendship. The appraiser values the book at about... Seven to nine hundred dollars. Oh, wow. So not bad That's for amazing. 15 cents, I have oh, to say. Incredible. The antique tea set, which beauty is a sight for sore eyes, makes way to the show. The guest bought the tea set from an antique dealer in 1973 for $200. The tea set has similarities to 18th century pieces with its small size and unique style painting. The style is similar to Dresden's style. The appraiser reveals some truth to the piece's authenticity. Unfortunately, although this has some good attributes, it is a fake, an antique fake. It's well over 100 years old, but it is a fake of a much earlier porcelain. The tea set was made by company Helena Wolfson in the 1880s. It was valued around four to $600. Oh, wow. Which okay. sounds is a decent amount of money. It right. still is a nice piece of hand-painted Dresden porcelain. Interesting. I'm just surprised. I, I, I had really thought that I had a 300-year-old piece. A piece of memorabilia which leaves the appraiser reminiscing of the good old days. The guests who had never been to the restaurant bought the Stage Deli's wall clock at a thrift store for $78. The Stage Deli, a restaurant owned by businessman Mac Asnes, was located in New York from 1937 to 2012. The deli was famous for its Broadway-themed dishes and also for naming dishes based on celebrities who dine there. The clock, which is of the 1970s, cannot be confirmed to either be the actual clock used in the deli or just decorative items sold as souvenirs. The appraiser gives conditions for proper appraisal of the clock. If you can come back to me with a photo of this clock inside the stage deli, I will change my appraisal from $200 to $2,000. Well, that's good news. Incredibly, a small metal object can hold such immense historical value. This is the number plate of John Lennon's childhood at home. 
If you're a fan of classic rock music, you probably heard of John Lennon and the Beatles. The guest uncle gave the number plate to him. Occasionally, people would wander into the house garden to take pictures in and of the house. As a Beatles fan, this is a treasure memorabilia. I think if that was put into a specialist Beatles sale, this would make five to eight thousand pounds easily. About a year ago, this guest stumbled upon a hidden gem at Brimfield. The guest revealed that she acquired the piece for a mere seventy-five dollars. Little did she know that the exquisite piece would turn into something historical. Well, let's talk about what it is. A lot of people would call it a jug or a pitcher, but I would call it a wine ewer. And at the time it was made, the Italian Renaissance was very much part of the modern taste. The late 19th century emerges as a golden age of Renaissance revivalism. This piece was a great example of Molica, referring to the colors and glazes on it. There are a number of makers that come to mind, the best known being Minton, and also Wedgwood made, these two big firms made great majolica. The esteemed English firm Copeland crafted pieces that paid homage to this time of style. The quality of the modeling is superb. And I looked it over and I think it's in perfect condition, uh, which is unusual for something of this age and fragility. Well, not labeled as a priceless item, the piece still could fetch four or five times its purchase price. The appraiser suggests a retail value of $700. The silver eyeglass case, originally brought to the show by his guests, originally belonged to her great-great-great-grandfather. It was alleged an early 18th century relic, the world's first sunglasses. The guest believe was rooted in a slip of paper with her grandmother's handwriting, providing historical details. Um, made out of nine silver dollars in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, sometime between 1728 and 1768. However, after a meticulous inspection, the twist in the tale was revealed by one of the great makers like uh, Benjamin Burt. Upon opening the case, it revealed the hallmark Robert and William Wilson, Philadelphia, the marker's mark. He was working around 1825 to the middle part of the 19th century, which unfortunately makes it impossible for it to have belonged to that relative of yours in the 18th century. Despite the time gap, the silver eyeglass case is still acknowledged and could serve as a dual-purpose snuff box. You don't find too many American coin silver spectacle boxes, so it's extremely interesting. As an uh, American coin silver box of the early 19th century, it's worth about 1000 to 1500 The accompanying silver spectacles are also found from the 19th century. I assume these belong to another relative of yours, and these fetch at auction about $100 or so. They're not as rare as the box.